Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Embrace the Question. It's good to be seen by you this December 29th, almost the new year, which will be 2024. I want to say thank you for following me throughout this year. We have done a lot as far as covering ground in our studies in Bible study with me. We've done a few chosen videos. Our Bible study with me, we've covered Genesis. We've covered half now of Exodus. We'll be doing Exodus 16 today. And I just want to thank you for sticking with me, for your support, for those who have ventured over to the blog or to my Patreon page and have decided to support me in those ways. That has been invaluable to me, really. Every one of you that have left comments on any of those platforms, including YouTube. I think about you. I think about your comments. I think about uh, what you have added. Your perspectives have all been very, very insightful and very, very important to me as far as how I am learning to teach these subjects. And I just want to thank you again for being a part of this little community that we have here. It's been an interesting holiday season for me. Uh, we're, we've had uh, problems in our family as far as a vehicle wreck uh, in, in my wife's side of the family, which was pretty serious, but everything's going to be okay. It's just been a trying time. Uh, my dear neighbor, whom I have lived next to for the last 20 years, passed away in his sleep yesterday. That really makes you think when it's that close to home, literally. Nothing's guaranteed for tomorrow that we can see, is it? So while we sometimes enjoy a nice, quiet, whole, healthy holiday season and are able to reflect in peace, it is not so peaceful for some others. So I think that also gives value to what we're doing here. This close look at the Word of God, these 30-minute increments that we're taking out of our day to just look at the eternal aspects of what our existence is. I mean, it's, it's just like this is the one thing that we can focus on that will never go away. I hope this adds to your peace. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16 and see what kind of truth we can mine out of that passage. Okay, Exodus 16, English Standard Version. I'm reading out of eSword on the screen. A free download for you, e-sword.net, if you want to follow up on that, if you need a, a digital Bible to check out. Uh, it does not require internet once you have it downloaded, so you can take it with you, read it on the airplane, whatever you like. You can download as many commentaries or translations as you like for this. So let's start. Exodus 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam. This is the Israelites after they've left the Red Sea, okay, from Exodus 15. That's where we left off. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. Sometimes you'll, you'll see it pronounced Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Let's, let's stop right there. We'll, re, we'll recall from Exodus 15, that Elam means palm trees. So it's um, a bit of an oasis. If you do your, your Google look up on Elam, you'll see palm trees in the middle of a desert. Also, there were 12 wells there. And we talked about the significance of 70 palms and 12 wells. Okay, It's, uh, it's a pleasant picture, a pleasant mental image if you, if you know what the barrenness of the Judean wilderness looks like. This is where they found the springs to be bitter. 
mara, right? Bitter. And Moses throws the stick into the wells, into the water, and makes it sweet, makes it drinkable again. So they've already had one test at Elam. And you can say that they didn't do the best, right? They, they're not used to depending on God for every little thing. So there's a learning curve to following the Lord. Now grumbling, your translation may say murmuring. Grumbling and murmuring tend to be somewhat akin to gossip. It's not productive. It is not leaning towards a solution. It is simply complaining and not just complaining within oneself but propagating the disease of discontent, basically. So it is only destructive, and it really has no redeeming value to it. Murmuring is something that God put up with less and less as they went further and further, because it's, one, a sign of immaturity. It's what we do when we, we haven't learned to trust. It's something that we do when we embrace bitterness, okay? So as we go, as we're expected to mature, we're not expected to grumble like we would when we are just starting our journey of faith, okay? This is where they are. They're grumbling against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse 3, And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. You can see what grumbling does. It makes you irrational. They've already forgotten how miserable Egypt was. When they look back into Egypt, they think of full flesh pots, right? Pots of stew, if you will. Food was so plentiful. Right? It was so pleasant to be in Egypt. No, it wasn't. They were complaining there. They're complaining here. And you can see what we do. This is not localized to a group of people in Israel. This is the human way of never being content when we don't have faith. Faith will provide contentment. No faith, no satisfaction. All right, let's continue. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Okay, so we know that this is manna, even though it hasn't been identified as such just yet. We know that this is manna. It says it's fallen from heaven, although they pick it up from the ground as if it were dew, and it's some kind of test, and we don't understand the testing aspect of it just yet, other than there's going to be a day's portion every day. Where's the, where's the test in that? It appears that we're going to have enough to eat every day, but... Mm, all the stipulations haven't been outlined for us yet. Okay, so we don't really know what the test is so far. I mean, we're going to uh, we're going to find out rather quickly what people want to do with this manna, and we're also going to discover that manna is a picture of something or someone, and they are unfamiliar with both. Okay, let's continue verse. Five On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. One day you get twice as much on the sixth day. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us, Moses and Aaron? You're not grumbling against us. You're grumbling against the Lord. A couple of things popped out at me on this part right here. At the evening you will know. At the evening you shall know. 
and in the morning you will see. The evening you will know, and in the morning you will see. I find that really interesting. We've always, through Scripture, had a differentiation in between the morning and the evening. The evening came first in Genesis. It was the evening and it was the morning the first day, a differentiation. We know that there are other scriptures. Uh, scriptures, joy comes in the morning, which means evenings can be difficult. The setting of the sun, the approaching of the darkness. It's hard sometimes to get through the night and we wait expectantly for the morning. It's in the morning that the provision comes here. It's in the morning that the provision comes, but it says in the evening you will know. Hmm, in the morning you will see. I'm gonna leave that with you. Let me know in the comments what you think about the evening and the morning in this context. Verse eight, and Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling and that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. That he is, he's not really saying, all right, he's heard your complaint. Here we go. No, he's, he's scolding them. You've been grumbling and he's heard it. And so he's going to put up with it and he's going to give you what your heart thinks it wants at this time. But he's not being kind to them in this. I, Moses is not going easy on them. All right. He's saying, God's heard you. Not good. Verse 10. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. That would be an amazing thing to see, wouldn't it? Remember, they're following a pillar in the sky. I think of it much like a tornado. I don't know if it was or wasn't, but that's how I view it. A pillar in the sky of cloud in the day and of fire at night. That would be an amazing thing. I would love to know what that looked like. But now they see the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 12, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. You would think, Right? And this is another thing that God does for us. He gives us all this provision and he does it so that we will know he is the provider. And yet we wake up full, fat and happy, if you will, pardon the, the old cliche <laughs> expression. And then we forget where that provision came from. Okay. That's what's going on here. You will know that I am the Lord, your God. So perhaps he's saying you will down deep know that I have provided this. Verse 13, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp and in the morning dew lay around the camp. There is a, uh, there's a migration of quail around the Red Sea area and it, they blow across the water. The winds carry them and they fly and they fly and they fly. And as I have heard it said, by the time they get to the other side where they can land, they are so tired that you can just walk over and pick them up because they can't, they, they don't have the energy to fly anymore. This is a real phenomenon, so to speak. So this is uh, perhaps what we're talking about. Quail everywhere. Pick them up, cook them, eat them at your leisure, right? All you want, quail. And by the way, quail is pretty tasty if you've never had it. So they, they're laying around the camp. That's verse 13 and verse 14. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the ground or was on the face of the wilderness, a fine flake-like thing. Fine as frost on the ground. I like that. A fine flake-like thing. Verse 14. 15. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? 
for they did not know what it was. And, and Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Now we know full well that this is a picture of Jesus, the manna from heaven, the bread sent from heaven. He claimed this himself many times, that I am the bread sent from heaven. The fact that it means what is it is really provoking to me because manna means literally it translates what is it. They didn't understand the concept, nor would any of us. How, how can bread just appear? And how is this actually bread? It's something we've never seen before. Bread appearing on the ground. When you wake up in the morning, you leave your tent. It's covering the ground like snow. You just have to go out, kneel down, and pick it up. And much has been made, many sermons taught, about the kneeling down aspect. If you want Jesus, it starts with the knelt down position. Okay, I like the picture. But you can only get enough for today. You can only get enough for today. You're gathering up all that will fill you for today. And there are so many angles to this that I, I don't even know where to start, but it's fascinating, manna. What is it? This is new, I haven't seen this before. Much like Jesus, when he appears to the people of Israel some 1500 years later-ish, they've never seen anyone like him. What is this? Isn't this the carpenter's son? How can he know what he knows? Who gave him his authority? Where did he get his learning? All of these questions, this mystery surrounding this Nazarene native, and nobody understands who is he? What is it? Picture. I love pictures. Verse 16. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat, you shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. Okay, so you can gather up as much as your tent can consume, the people in your tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. That's, that's interesting because what, it's, what it says is in life, some people will perhaps pursue Jesus more. Some people were, will perhaps pursue Jesus less. Will that mean that each has just what he needs or just enough? These are questions that I find fascinating. Love, love this passage here. But when they measured it, it was with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. It reminds me a little bit of the, the parable that Jesus told of the workmen, right? Some worked all day long and received a wage. Some worked 30 minutes and received the same wage. There's, there's an, a leveling out there, uh, an, an equalizing, if you will, a balancing. I don't understand. I don't understand how it works. But what we're seeing here introduced is the economy system of heaven. So that's why this is so fascinating. It's 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 putting into a physical picture the economy of God, and it goes against the grain, doesn't it? I mean, people that gather less. They should have less, right? People that get out there and bust it and really work together more, shouldn't they have more? Well, they should in our in our economy, right? Our, our society says, yeah, not necessarily everything in God's economy works like ours. Hmm. So maybe we need to try to think differently. Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over 
until the morning. Hmm. Verse 20. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Now remember, this was a test. Perhaps this is the test. Will you trust me to follow me, to obey me, to gather only what you need for today, and trust that tomorrow's provision will be there tomorrow? Verse 21, morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each, and when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept until the morning. So they laid it aside till morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. All right, so we're back to this idea of twice as much on the sixth day so that we can have enough without working for it on the seventh day, the Sabbath. The people will take this, and they will make the Sabbath of the utmost importance. And you can't really blame them because early on here, they were very rigid, very rigid with the Sabbath day rules. By the time Jesus comes, the Sabbath was the God. It was almost a form of worship of a day. Jesus said the, the Sabbath was made for people. People were not made for the Sabbath which is how they were treating it. We were created to celebrate the Sabbath. No, Jesus says, the Sabbath was created for you so that you can rest. And we'll find out later that the Sabbath was created for the land, for the, the earth. Let the land rest on the seventh day. You can farm on it for six, but let it rest on the seventh. That becomes a big problem for them, a snare, if you will. As religious as they became at following the Sabbath and following it properly, they failed in that area to let the land rest, and that's going to get them into big, big trouble. All right, let's keep going. Verse 24 or verse 25, Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Didn't even come up. There should have been no temptation to go out and gather because there was no provision on that seventh day. Not in that way. All right, six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Okay, another failed test, right? They went out to gather, even after Moses tells them plainly, don't go. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Okay, so already, already we are finding the scolding. We are, we are getting rebuked by God because we can't listen. We can't follow instructions, even the simple ones. Verse 29, see, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Well, I guess after a little while, they figured it out, right? There's no reason to get up. Just stay put. And there's nothing to do. Not on this day. Verse 31. Now, the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. I obtained some coriander seeds, and they're, they're just little bitty guys like BBs, the shape of BBs, and I spray painted them white. They're, the coriander, real coriander seed is a brown, tan-ish seed, and I just spray painted them white in a box, and I put them in a, a Ziploc, and I put them in my Bible, and I kept them for a while as kind of a prop to show when I taught this chapter. 
It's really interesting because the Bible literally says they're like coriander seed. So get you some coriander seed, spray paint them white, and you've got something that really does resemble what manna looked like. Amaze your friends, right? They, they uh, are like wafers made with honey. Verse 32, Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses is already hinting that there's coming a day soon when this provision won't be there, so we want to keep a sampling of it in a jar so that the people will remember this provision. Perhaps an inference to the time when they will be in the promised land. None of these folks, by the way, know that their, their exodus is going to take another 38 years or so. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. This will go in the Ark of the Covenant, by the way. This is one of the items found within the Ark. When they And they haven't built it yet. So that's all still coming. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. Why is this part of testimony? Because God's provision is always going to be the central part of your testimony. That's what your testimony will be about. I went through hard times, but he provided. Always remember that. I will always be able to pull this out of the ark and show others, this is it. This is what got me through. And as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. Verse 35, the people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan and Omar. And Omar is the 10th part of an ephah. Now what's an ephah? Well, it's approximately 10 times an Omer. Yeah, I have no idea. These are, these are, Things I haven't studied, but you can imagine an omer. I think of it like a quart jar. Enough for today, right? Enough for one person for a day. So if you had five people in your tent, you were able for that tent to go out and collect five quart jars, maybe a little bigger, of manna. Then what they would do is they would fashion these into cakes or pancakes, if you will. They would bake them. They would, uh, they would fry them on rocks, kind of like pancakes. Some would boil them like dumplings. And I'm sure it was just good to eat as it was, like cereal, if you will. So interesting stuff. And think, three million people in a wilderness. If it's not this, they're trying to eat rocks. There's not a lot to eat in the wilderness. Well, that was Exodus 16. Pretty interesting chapter. We're, t we're talking about something they have never seen before, manna, and it will be a staple for them for the next 40 years. And beyond that, it will be a central part of their testimony about God and how he provided for them in the wilderness. They will cling to this for the next millennia and a half and beyond. It's an amazing thing that God did in the desert. So perhaps you're going through a really dry place in your life right now. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe you've lost a job and your provision isn't how it has been. Just know that God provides for his own. He always does. And you will, if you sit and think, you will remember all that he has done in the past. And that can build your faith in your knowledge that he will do the same again, which is what testimony means. Do it again. So I wish you a very blessed and whole holiday season, the remainder of it. It will be 
two days until the new year. So I wish you prosperity and health, and I will see you again next year.